Hello? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll tell them. Thank you. Hey, Bio 20s. Looks like it's time for again for another lesson. Today, we're going to be starting our last chapter, Chapter 5, Evolution. We're going to talk a little bit about some evidence that led to the theory of evolution. Now, before we do, I just want to quickly explain the science behind how we actually categorize organisms. Um, classifying organisms based on their Latin binomenclature is known as taxonomy. So it's proposed by Carl Linnaeus for a few reasons here. Number one is if we don't have a set language, much like the periodic table can be country to country, people use the periodic table, the same applies for biological um, naming. We need a set system, so you go country to country, you know how to name things. Another reason is organisms in one part of the world could be called something different in another part of the world, even though they're the same organism. So what we use is a um, system where we have every organism getting a two-part scientific name using Latin words. That two-part scientific name contains the genus followed by the species. So for example, the American bat black bear would be Ursus, which is its genus, followed by its species, Americanus. Now, just looking at how organisms are organized, going from broad to specific, we start here with the domain. So in this case, our domain is eukarya or eukaryotic organisms. We then move on to our kingdom, animalia or animals. We then move on to our phylum, chordata, so anything with a backbone. We then move to our class, mammalia, our mammals. Order, in this case, carnivora, so our carnivores. Family, ursidae, so bears. And then our genus, which now becomes our three bears here, getting specific here, the American black bear, Ursus americanus. So going from most um, broad to most specific, we would go domain, king, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then species. Oops. There we go. So like I said before, why do we need this? It's a logical system, it brings order, understood globally and common names can be misleading. So for example, the cougar, the puma, and the mountain lion, that are all the same organisms. Ringworms and mealworms aren't actually worms. So this kind of gives us at least some order and some global um, logic behind all of this. Now, into some evidence of evolution. So there's some key factors here that led to the theory of evolution. The first bit of evidence comes from paleontology or fossils. So there's a strong connection here that we look at organisms that used to live on Earth, we compare them to organisms that live now on Earth, and we notice, huh, there's some similarities or there's a logical progression that occurred. So we notice that um, a few patterns have emerged. Number one, most species are actually now extinct. So most species that have lived on Earth are unfortunately now extinct. Number two, there's a systematic progression from very simple organisms to very complex organisms. And number three, species and their most closely matching fossils are usually found in the same geographic area. Um, we know kind of the progression because we can do something called radiometric dating or carbon dating, where we actually look at how old the fossils are. So it is believed at this moment that Earth is about 4.5 billion years old judging by the oldest known rocks that they found. Now, what we can do is we can actually look, oops, before I move on here, what we can actually do is you can actually look at the fossil and see how far the carbon has decayed. So it's called radiometric dating or carbon dating. And then depending on, okay, this fossil contains this version of carbon, this fossil contains this version of carbon, this one is now older than this one, so we know that this organism came before this organism. And we can kind of put them in order and then see that progression I was talking about. Now, onto biogeography, we notice that organisms actually tend to once again seem very similar to the organisms that are found in their area. Now, a long time ago, we used to have all the continents put together in this mega landmass called Pangaea. So organisms were free to move all over the place. And then through time, as the land masses have shifted and tectonic plates have moved farther apart, the continents have drifted farther and farther apart. And what this has done is given us some interesting fossil locations. 
So we notice that some fossils, right, older fossils, might be found in South Africa, Africa, India, Antarctica, and Australia. You're like, how is that possible? Well, at one point, all of these continents were locked together. However, some fossils might only be found in, say, South American Africa. Okay, so maybe these continents or these land masses have now drifted away, but at this very moment, Africa and South America were still attached, so this organism would be found in both. And now, newer fossils are only going to be found in certain geographic areas because there's no possible way they could have gone, say, from Australia to North America without the land masses being, atta being um, attached. Okay, another thing we can look at for evidence is the evidence from anatomy. So just looking at the anatomy of organisms. So for example, if you look at the four limbs of a bird, a whale, a horse, and a human, they're different, right? They all have different functions, but they share a similar bone arrangement. We refer to this as a homologous feature. So a homologous feature would be different function, but similar structure. So we notice that all the bones, right? The bones are similar in their arrangement or their structure, but we have much different function for all of these, right? A bat wing, whale flipper, cat paw, human head. Then we move to an analogous feature, which would be similar structure, right? These are all wings, or sorry, this would be similar function, um, different structure, sorry. So we have wings that all look different, right? Bat wings, insect wings, bird wings, they're all for flying, right? Similar function, but they have a different structure. So just to recap, analogous features are features that have the same function, like flying, but different structure. Homologous features are then similar structure, but a different function. And another feature we can look at is something called a vestigial feature, right? So a vestigial feature would then be a feature, I'm just going to jump ahead here, um, vestigial features, which would be features that seem like they serve no purpose. The example I can give here is whales have a pelvis and a femur bone. And you're like, why would a whale have that? There's no purpose that they have that. However, if you look back throughout time, way, 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 way back in the past, there may have been an ancestor of a whale that did have flippers at the back here. And over time, it was unnecessary for them to have those flippers, so they got smaller and smaller and smaller. And throughout the course of evolution, the whale evolved to no longer need that. However, they could not fully remove the femur and the pelvis, so it's still there, just very, very small. Um, leading back to our embryonic development here, same kind of idea in terms of, okay, we look at some similarities and some differences, okay? This is a lizard, a tortoise, a pig, and a human. All early on in embryonic development, we look pretty similar, right? And then we go to a few more weeks down the road, a few more months down the road. These two reptiles still look very similar, two mammals look very similar, and then as we get further down, we can clearly see, okay, that's a lizard, that's a tortoise, that's a pig, and that's a human. So we see evolutionary similarities between, say, a human and a pig versus these two reptiles. And same thing, these two reptiles seem much more related based on their embryos than those two. So another piece of evidence that supports the theory that organisms are changing throughout time. Okay, finally we have evidence from bio, um, sorry, biochemistry. So evidence from chemistry or DNA. So we actually look at the DNA markers, the amino acids and the DNA within organisms and match them up. So we can actually match up how similar species are based on their DNA. So for example, humans and apes are pretty, pretty similar, right? Humans and dogs, about 32 different amino acids different. Um, and then birds and then frogs and the lamprey, all the way, like an eel, all the way over here. So we see that humans have a lot in common with our closest relatives versus other organisms that we don't have as much in common with. Although, um, as we know, most of our DNA is very, very similar to our closest relatives, right? The chimpanzees, the bonobos, the apes. Um, we do share a shocking amount of DNA similar to a banana. So I think, I, I think it's about 50 to 60% of our DNA is actually the same as a banana. So 
you can see that everything does have similarities, but then the differences will then separate us based on how, like, the difference, how far apart we are on this genetic tree or this phylogenetic tree. Um, we can also look at evidence from artificial selection where humans are actually selecting what traits move on. So we see this in dogs a lot. We also see this in um, a species here of sea cabbage. So from sea cabbage, say you wanted a flower that looks like this, you get cauliflower. So then humans would artificially select sea cabbage that only look like this, breed it to get more sea cabbage that look like this. Over time, we have ourselves cauliflower. Or we get kale, we get broccoli, we get Brussels sprouts, all from this one plant. So based on humans choosing what traits they want can influence how a species evolves. So humans can actually play a role in this as well. That's called artificial selection. So next lesson, we're gonna discuss how the theory of evolution actually came about. We see all this evidence. Now we're gonna use this evidence to put it together into how evolution actually works and how the theory actually came about. So thanks again for watching and we'll chat soon.